UN headquarters in New York, always a great venue for a round of How Green Was My Politician. The UN hosting a climate summit to kick off its annual opening of the General Assembly. Lofty speeches aside, the problem is that those leaders you see answer to their constituents back home. They have virtually no sway over what happens beyond national boundaries. Is France, for instance, meeting its climate targets when it supports domestic beef producers, yet imports soybeans to feed the cows that come from places like Brazil? Is Germany going green when it closes coal plants but imports electricity from Poland? Germany, whose chancellor last Friday unveiled a raft of measures to meet its energy transition targets, but critics argue that because Berlin constitutionally can intentionally run a budget deficit, it's at best a Green New Deal light. France, despite the activism of its president, is arguably faring worse. Emmanuel Macron's been fencing from afar with his absent Brazilian counterpart Jair Bolsonaro, while Donald Trump made a surprise cameo appearance at that summit. And if some major powers are reluctant, who else can reach across borders and make an impact? Well, perhaps multinational corporations. Last Thursday, Amazon and Google announced ambitions to become carbon neutral ahead of schedule. Genuine intent? or greenwashing public relations stunts, we'll ask our panel today in the France 24 debate. We're asking how to cool it, the planet that is, and with us to talk about it, Clémence Dubois, France campaigner for the environmental advocacy group 350.org. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, also with us is Anne Frisch, associate professor at uh, the French business school HEC. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Jakob Hessler, commentator, and uh, entrepreneur. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And from New York, David Cantor, who teaches environmental studies at New York University. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Good to be with you. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate. What's changed since the same time last year at UN Week? Well, the mobilization of young people. The one-day summit at UN headquarters in New York comes off the back of another huge Fridays for Future uh, a round of marches around the globe. And there you saw Greta Thunberg uh, front and center as Donald Trump walked by, the emblematic 16-year-old Swede who uh, grabbed, you could say, more headlines than Trump when she spoke with emotion in her voice. You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet, I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Clémence Dubois, your reaction? Yes, how dare them. And I'm as angry as uh, Greta is when I hear that world leaders are being gathered in the UN because I know who the leaders are. It's the civil society, it's the children and the adults who join their hands together uh, this Friday and this week to say that we have the solution. We know that uh, what climate action is, it means keeping the fossil fuel in the grounds. It means breaking the status quo. It means acting for the common good and not in the interest of the fossil fuel industry, which still has the ear of uh, the government. Um, I'm angry when I hear Macron um, introducing himself as the champion of the earth, while our institutions in France are denouncing the fact that he's not acting as he should. How's he not acting? He is not acting because, for instance, we talked about the money flows. They indeed talk a lot about, uh, a lot about money. But if you look where the French public money is going, it's still going to the fossil fuel industry far more than it's going to the renewable energy. And for instance, after this historic march uh, and strikes on Friday, Emmanuel Macron ask the children that it would be better if they went to Corsica to pick some garbage? And uh, is that really uh, yeah, let, what let, he has to answer? 
let, let, let's go over the, those remarks that you that you allude to as he headed to New York. Emmanuel Macron, perhaps glib, uh, he's quoted by French newspaper Le Parisien as saying, marching every Friday to say the planet's burning, that's nice, but it's not the problem. We need to enter into a form of collective action. I would prefer if every Friday we staged big cleanup operations around rivers or beaches in Corsica. You know what I can say after that is, that as far as I know, I think the Paris March has been the only one where children have been kettled by the police and have been paper sprayed. But is that their fault or the fault of those black bloc activists? This who is the fault of the police, which hasn't been able to deal with uh, dozens of individuals and have put children's families, old people who came here to say, we want a, we want a future. And this is the fault of the police. And this is what we've seen for the past months with the Yellow Vest. The Yellow Vest, the climate movement, are asking the same. They're, we are asking for justice, climate justice, social justice. And the only thing that Macron has been able to answer is or police repression or, oh, we're going to create an external debate, an external uh, council for whatever, instead of taking immediate measures. Yeah, because on Saturday, yeah. just to explain to our viewers, Saturday there was a demonstration in Paris, and at the outset of it, at the very beginning of the, the, the demonstration for the, for, for the climate, suddenly there was these black blocks that erupted, there was a skirmish with police, and there was tear gas, and... I was there. Mm -hmm. I saw it. I was there, and I pulled back when uh, the tear gas started. And frankly, uh, for me, the, the topic is not whether Macron is doing the right thing and whether uh, people uh, were not able to march in Paris. It's just that France is behind. I mean, in France, okay, we had 16,000 persons in Paris. And in Germany, there were 100,000 persons at Brandenburg tour. And so the mobilization and the understanding of what's a sake is so much higher in Germany and in all the Northern Europe countries. So we're getting there, but we are behind. How do you explain that? Well, uh, French people uh, don't care as much as the environment. It's also very much in the, in the culture and in the mindset. The environmental movements in Germany, I mean, are not just from the 70s. They come back to the beginning of the 20th uh, century. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but this is simply not true because there has been, uh, you know, an opinion poll uh, a week ago that says that environment and climate change is the major preoccupation across every social classes. So I'm sorry. Yes, but if, it's not if people... as visible. The thing is, the political action that follows is not yet as visible, whereas I think in more northern countries, there's much more organized political actions, be it through the normal representation, which is, I think, one you, of the sources of your, of your frustration, which is that there's all this pent-up desire to do something, and it doesn't have an institutional structure or structures that are capable to act on it, such as a viable Green Party, Absolutely. such as... And, of course, for France, it's easy yeah. because, A, it has nuclear energy, and that way it is much easier for France to meet the CO2 targets. So in that sense, it is a sort of... It well, has we did see a jump on, in the Green Party's of, uh, yes. standing uh, at the, at, at the, in the last European elections, a sizable jump. Yes, and that's a, that's a precursor, I think, of what's about to come. But we are not, I think we're not there yet. And I think there's a more fundamental one, which is that I think in the French intellectual tradition, the domination of nature by man is in general considered a good thing. And it is not that man emerges from nature, the relation between man and nature or humankind and nature is more like that. And so I think it's more difficult to switch to a setting where suddenly you feel you are part of nature, that nature is endangered, and you need to do something about it. I want to bring in David Cantor just for a moment. Uh, D David, uh, it's true that here in France, we're used to our political arguments being right versus left, this kind of thing. Here you have Greta Thunberg and people like her um, who, who aren't making arguments uh, across what is a traditional political divide. They're simply saying, hey, politicians, do what you're supposed to do. Right. So first, I would say I would love that the debate that you were just having was anywhere close to the debate that's happening in the United States right now. Uh, but really, we're at step zero when it comes to how climate change is debated in the political sphere here, at least at the national level. Um, 
And you're right that the energy for this really is coming from younger generations. And I'm uh, one of the things that makes me very hopeful about our efforts to deal with climate change is the upcoming generation of leaders. However, uh, we don't have the time to wait for that next generation of leaders to step up. And as Greta Thunberg said in her comments, it is unfair to her and the, uh, this young generation to put our weight, the weight of expectations on their shoulders. The kind of transformations that the science makes clear need to happen for us to have any chance of staying below 2 degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees increase, need to happen now. We need to transform how we get our energy and our David, food. David, you, you, you uh, say that there's... Yesterday. You say that uh, you're at level zero when it comes to debating climate action, but we've all paid attention here in Europe because it's from Washington that this concept of a Green New Deal has come with uh, certain lawmakers in the U.S. arguing for big infrastructure spending to help this energy transition. Yes, so those ideas um, are exciting and are happening within the Democratic Party, and arguably the ambition that's shown amongst different Democratic candidates is largely because of this younger generation that is pushing for more action. Um, but unfortunately, there is a very little um, opportunity for cross-party discussions because there is one party that largely denies the science, i.e. the Republican Party. And um, there, the chances of a Green New Deal actually becoming law will only occur if the institutions, such as the Senate, are, are changed, where you get rid of, for example, the 60-vote threshold, the filibuster. So the actual chance of these deals becoming law need to be accompanied by a much more fundamental change in how American institutions are run. Clemence Dubois, one final word on what's going on right now in, at UN headquarters. We're hearing, you're talking about the French president not stepping up, but he has made these big pledges to this green fund to um, to help uh, the developing world transition. And we've also heard, and we'll talk about it more in a minute, about uh, Germ Germany's chancellor doubling her pledge. Uh, there was a similar pledge coming from the UK prime minister. It yeah. is an inaction, is it? Uh, well, we are quite used to those kind of declarations in France because M M Emmanuel Macron and his government are actually uh, spending uh, all their time saying uh, what should be done and not acting upon it. Uh, but I think, you know, for instance, one me meaningful thing, since we are looking for direct action, uh, while those heads of states are gathering in the UN, uh, CEOs of oil companies, so the real criminals, those who are responsible of the climate crisis, are gathering few blocks uh, next to the summit. So one first step should be to maybe place them under arrest, for instance, because this is what we're talking about. It's a power game between very little pe people, the CEOs of the fossil fuel industry, and the majority of us. And already millions of people have been dying because uh, our elected politicians, institutions, are not willing to face this power issue. And this is why m millions of people are rising around the world to confront the fossil fuel industry, to confront those uh, who are financing them. Because that's also the problem. For instance, I've seen that 130 banks have pledged to act upon climate uh, at the UN summit. So what does that mean? Does that mean that they will stop investing at all in oil, yes. coal, mm. and gas? Yes. Or does that mean that they will just like reduce no, by bits? Okay. Let, so let's talk about the oil industry and that investment. It's a very good example. And let's observe what's happening in Norway. So Norway has one of the biggest oil companies. Uh, it's called Statoil. Um, and it's deep in, in oil and gas, no doubt about it. And it's also owned by the Norwegian government. It's a state company. Uh, at the same time, the Norwegian uh, sovereign fund has decided to divest from oil and gas. And th that's a, a serious decision, and they're acting upon it. So, so you really see the shift. You cannot say all industry is bad, and they're the nasty guy, and they're the criminals. They're changing, probably not at the right pace. There are many forces. You can also look at the automotive industry in Germany, what's happening there. Look at Volkswagen. Volkswagen had their annual general meeting 
in April, disrupted by an environmental activist from Fridays for Future, a young lady of the, of the same charisma as Greta, 18 year old. She was able to get into the annual general meeting and speak for five minutes. And she said to the CEO, we don't want your electro SUVs. And, and she had the opportunity to say it. And, and frankly, Volkswagen, we can say lots of things about them, and they had the diesel gate, and they had all, all these things, but they're also moving. And they're moving um, with an investment of 30 billion euros on electro um, vehicles. They have pledged to, have, to sell 2 million vehicles, electro vehicles. And this is at the risk of, um, for Germany, um, uh, of the employment, because it puts at risk many jobs, but they're going for it. So you see the industry is moving. I agree with you, Clemence. Sorry, I'm confused. It might not be at the right pace, Volkswagen, but Volkswagen, is it the company that has lied and that... Yes. Oh, OK. Yeah, and but so companies uh, do act on their mistakes and they change. And so are you uh, saying that the fossil fuel industry, for instance, is changing? Because this is exactly their playbook. And we know their playbook by heart as they've known about climate change for decades. For instance, Total, our major uh, in energy industry, is saying that they're committed for a responsible energy. What is their biggest energy project now? It's in the Arctic. It's called Yamal, and it's extracting the, uh, the gas that is uh, coming in Europe, labeled as renewable energy. And meanwhile, Total is congratulating themselves that they can pour more gas quicker because the Arctic is melting, so their boat can... Uh, can go quicker. Plus, they have a new project in South Africa. They have a new project in Mozambique. Uh, so I, every, I agree every, with you, Clemence, that going for oil exploration in the Arctic is not the thing to do. Going for but, oil exploration, full stop, but, but is not But the energy not what mix do. is something right. of a long term. You cannot change it overnight. overnight. We we're don't pick have up, the time. So it's we, criminal to say that we have decades again. We're going to pick Social up on that change, point. Takes a long time. I agree with you. But we're gonna, we don't have that time. We're going to pick up on that point when we come back and look at the specific example of Europe's largest economy, Germany. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate and we're looking at the one day UN climate summit taking place in New York and asking on the heels of a fresh report saying the earth is heating up even faster than expected, how we can go faster in uh, trying to reduce our carbon habits. We're talking about it uh, with Clémence Dubois, France campaigner for the environmental advocacy group 350.org. Uh, Anne Frisch, who is a teacher at the uh, French business school HEC. Jacob Hessler, commentator and entrepreneur. And David Cantor, who teaches environmental studies at New York University. Thank you for being with us from New York. Uh, Germany's chancellor, arriving in New York for UN Week after, as we were talking about it earlier with Anne Frisch, massive Friday demonstrations, including those 100,000 who turned out Friday in Berlin. Friday, the day that Angela Merkel unveiled her government's long-anticipated plan for meeting her country's pledge to go carbon neutral by 2030. Karis Garland filed this report at the time. Desperate for their government to take action. Hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets in Germany on Friday to demand more protection for the environment. And as if right on cue, Europe's biggest contributor of CO2 emissions revealed its plan to stop lagging behind on the fight against climate change. In large areas of sectors in which we've not achieved our objectives, namely buildings and transport, we have a large number of approaches. We have incentives to encourage people to behave in a more environmentally friendly way. Germany is set to commit at least 100 billion euros to climate action by 2030. 54 billion of that will be spent in the next four years. The policy includes incentives for buying electric cars and using public transport, as well as a carbon pricing system. The Greens have slammed the plan. With this climate protection plan, the federal government is completely shredding the 2020 climate target. 
the 2030 target will not be achieved with these climate protection plans either. Most of the measures will only begin when this federal government is no longer in office. Despite investments in renewable energy, Germany is on course to miss its emissions reduction targets for 2020 by a wide margin. Its transport sector in particular has failed to keep up with reduction targets, while coal generates 40% of the country's electricity. Jakob Hessler, right now you've got a grand coalition in Germany that brings together the centre-left and the centre-right. Was this as ambitious as they could be? Well, that's, of course, a question about whom you're talking to. I think the... I think one could imagine a more ambitious transition than the one put beforehand. And it is, of course, the fact that it's a grand coalition. You have interests sitting around the table that, when it comes to energy and energy mix, actually more or less sit on the same side of the table because the traditional trade unions strength, which want to preserve jobs in industries which often are high consumers of electricity and energy. And on the other hand, you have the traditional party. So in a way, I don't think that that's a very contentious issue among them, which is why the Greens were so understandably So what could help that. concentrate the minds is we could be heading into a recession in Germany. Yes. If that is the case, we were talking about with David Cantor earlier about the concept of a Green New Deal. Is uh, Would that be the case where for once the Germans could, would if the spend Germans, a bit of if money? If the Germans were finally losing their monetarist orthodoxy when it comes to understanding how the economy works. All economists across the world, left or right, progressive or not progressive, agree that by monetary policy you cannot solve this economic problem. What we need is a fiscal stimulus. And quite frankly, 54 billion over four years is nothing. It's nothing. It's a drop of, in the, uh, of water. And it's, in, and it's this sort of German obstination with this budget um, parity, which you can argue when you are in surplus... Yes, save the money. But the reason why you do that is so that you can invest. And I think there is a very erroneous interpretation also of the past. Why did Germany rise? It's because some people invested heavily at some point after the war in an infrastructure that was completely depleted. And in a certain way, we are in a similar situation. We have infrastructure that is, while not bombed, completely unfit for purpose. If we want an infrastructure that's fit for purpose, we need to invest massively in how to produce steel with electricity, how to, change, how to have carbon capture for cement. All these things are huge investments, ventures that require money to explore, to develop, and bring at scale. And with 54 billion, yeah. they're not going to go I far. I mean, I join you. And the 54 include, I think, half of it is just for the modernization of Deutsche Bahn. Yeah. And the people who <laughs> lived in Germany know... National how, Railroad. Yeah, it's yeah. National Railway and know how low performance uh, Deutsche Bahn has. So this, this modernization of Deutsche Bahn is long overdue. Yeah. But it's a good thing, and there, there, there are going to be incentives, for instance, yeah, in this plan yeah. for uh, people to take the train instead of the plane yeah. for short haul flights. Yeah, yes, and their it's car. Old wine and new, it's old wine and new uh, amphorae. That's the problem. Yeah. Is right. that you're doing a counting trick? Is again you say we have 54, and in fact, even if nothing about the climate but had happened, you would still spend 30 of the 54. 54, but again, compared to France. It's a lot. But we're not hearing this. We're not hearing this kind of plan here. I agree with you. France has not come up with a plan, but Europe is going to force us. And I count very much on our new uh, Europe Commissioner Ursula von der Leyen to steer that movement. Uh, David Good Cantor, uh, it was striking in the 2016 elections uh, when there were the presidential debates. They never mentioned the environment. Next year, is it going to be different when you hear the conversation going on here? I certainly hope so. Um, the fact is that the power of the oil and gas industry in this country and the funding that they have both in politics but also in funding misinformation around climate science uh, has been uh, unprecedented. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the fact that climate change is one of the top priorities of the democratic base bodes well for it being a, a more prioritized issue in presidential debates and in the presidential race uh, more generally. Um, to the point about Germany's Green New Deal and these other policies, uh, 
Of course, they are welcome. But as was mentioned before, these are in some ways rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, what is required when you look at the uh, science, the scientific consensus from thousands of top climate scientists, is that we need to reduce global emissions by half by How 2030 do do and get to net zero emissions by 2050. You do it by a massive transition to renewable energy. You do it by uh, transformation in how we uh, get our food towards um, uh, a way to reduce uh, meat consumption uh, and healthier diets. Uh, the strategies are going to be different in different countries, and there are challenges as well because there are several countries around the world that let, are still let, bringing. Let me ask you, David, because I know it's your I know it's your specialty. This issue of 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 uh, nutrition and and what we eat. Beef is it really that is it really that much impact? Can it really help by that much reducing our consumption of beef? Yes, uh, beef in particular has a huge carbon footprint, and in fact, meat consumption in general is uh, has impacts beyond just environment. There are obviously health impacts, and within the environmental impacts, it's not just climate. There are impacts on water. There are impacts on air. There are impacts on biodiversity because of the soy that needs to be grown to feed those animals, which is a major driver of deforestation in the Amazon and elsewhere around the world. Um, so our meat consumption has. Uh, broad tendrils in the entire global economy. And just reducing our meat consumption, uh, even by half and more, would have a huge impact on uh, global CO2 levels. The, the Clémence Dubois, uh, this is France, where you know, we were proud of our, of our cuisine. I noticed, though, that that cuisine is evolving. You now do have vegetarian dishes on the menu. Yeah, but let me tell you something. Uh, if we change our habits, it will only account for 8% of the CO2 emissions uh, reduction that we need to see. So the problem is really not on us, how we shower, how we eat. It is a, a problem that we need to address, but it's not the main problem. The thing is, we need to immediately phase out fossil fuel the fossil, the fossil fuels. That means divesting immediately from the fossil fuel industry to another economy uh, that we have to... Uh, we all have the solution and now we need to scale up the solution so we need to invest in them. And so how do we do to immediately phase out the fossil fuels? So what do you industry? put instead of fuel? We need to... Also. We need to disrupt the financiers. We need to be at every bank, at every corner. And maybe now it's every Friday. It needs to be every day. We need to, to tell them that they should stop investing in the fossil fuel industry. We need to be at the Ministry of Economy and Finance every day to so tell how do them you power to the economy? How do you power the economy if you don't have fossil fuels? You what know, do you do? You, now the, f the renewable energy okay. are cheaper than the the, um, the fossil fuels. The thing is, worldwide, the fossil fuel uh, fossil fuels are uh, subvention uh, get subsidized sub uh, subsidized twice 0.5 as much as the renewable uh, uh, renewables, and this is why we can't scale up the solutions. Even though those uh, solutions are scaling up thanks to a lot of citizens, a lot of entrepreneurs but that are pushing. Emmanuel and Macron trying to implement a carbon tax, which had been passed under his predecessor, and that's what sparked the yellow vest. That's movement. super interesting because, indeed, who needs to pay this transition? It would be super unfair to ask for the people who have done the list to pay this cost while we're sti still unable to make the polluters pay. And not only are we not making them pay, but we're still giving them public money, our money. And then we're asking the poorest people to pay for that. But I think, I think even if I see your outrage, I think still the path the thing we are discussing now, because we all agree here that it's not going fast enough, more needs to be done, and that fossil fuel needs to go down. The question is, what is the path that maintains an equilibrium, and maybe that path is not ambitious enough, but that maintains an equilibrium with the way people earn money. If you, the transition today, technology is not ready. We are not ready. If, for example, we say we phase out aggressively fossil fuels before we don't know how airplanes for at least short haul can fly with electricity. That will take another 10, 15 years. If we say, okay, you can't take an airplane anymore, which will happen eventually, we will need to 
to get back half our energy consumption, basically back to 1960s levels in resource consumption. But if you do this immediately, the shock to societies will be so big that pe and people are not Have ready you heard about the shock majority? that society is living right but now? Because if you're not outraged, just read the news I'm worldwide. Not, How I'm many people have I'm been not, dying? How many I'm ecosystems have been I'm killed? Saying, I'm saying then don't say that I'm outraged and I'm not talking about the past because that's no, precisely I'm, I'm what not. I'm doing. And you know, the problem is that exactly a lot of people especially that are privileged to be here, they think that we can't act too quickly because it's going to be, but it's going to change too much. But outrage is not enough. When we're talking about I'm energy. proposing solutions, but so yeah. please. Yeah, but technical solutions that we, are we workable. We have to find I a think. path, as uh, <clears> Jacob, <throat> you're saying. Some things take time. And I'm going to take an example which is a little bit provocative, but I do that on purpose. Okay, if you take quick decisions in energy under outrage, what happens? Mm. Uh, after Fukushima accident, Germany decided to exit the nuclear. And what, what did that uh, create? A rise in Uh, yeah. The use the of main coal. reason why Germany doesn't meet its CO2 yeah. targets that, is so because it decided a so, quick, uncoordinated exit yeah. of so, its nuclear so industry. So let's coordinate. We need global <clears throat> coordination. Uh, we need long-term thinking, and that's we need a mix of various types of energies. Otherwise, so, we just stop and go. While uh, you said something that is quite so, um, empty, I, I was here? just sure. like pointing something that the uh, I'm just talking about what the IPCC report is saying. I'm just talking about that. David Cantor. So uh, two points. One, just to build on the point of the market readiness now of renewables. In the U.S., there are more jobs in the solar industry than in all fossil fuels combined. And also, it's important to note the, the role of policy here, that uh, technology development doesn't just work by itself. It's not just this kind of organic beast that slowly grows in and of itself. It responds to policy signals. So while I agree what, we're, what is required, what the science demands is incredibly ambitious and, in, and almost revolutionary in scope. Uh, that th there needs to be a push from policy. There needs to be yes. a strong signal yeah. from the but policy community that, that we need to completely decarbonize. Years. And that is that's what will... But that... But that's but we've seen the massive acceleration in technology development when there's a clear signal from the policy community. And if there isn't there, which clearly the private sector hasn't really felt this strong signal from the policy community yet, you're not going to get that uh, widespread uh, acceleration in technology development and also the more fundamental social change that comes along with that. Let, let's talk about the private sector, David. Last week saw big carbon pledges from the likes of Google and Amazon. Amazon, whose CEO pledged his company would go carbon neutral by 2040, thanks to the purchase, most notably, of 100,000 electric vehicles, the planting of trees to offset the huge amounts of energy spent to power its giant computer servers. Jeff Bezos, who argues it's more environmentally friendly to offer same-day delivery with Amazon than to send packages from afar. Out that as you increase the speed of delivery, Uh, you have less carbon, that is counterintuitive, but the reason is that once you get to sort of one day and same day, you can't really do it by air transportation anymore. David Cantor, your reaction? Listen, on the one hand, you welcome pledges uh, by these massive corporations that are trying to do something ambitious on climate change. Uh, sometimes it's a bit depressing that we are looking towards the private sector always for, for the kind of moral leadership on this than our elected governments. Um, but at the same time, the private sector in certain cases can move more quickly. Uh, and there is a business case for it as well. Obviously, uh, being greener sometimes means also being more resource efficient. There's clearly demand for this from their consumers and also even from Amazon's own workforce where there was a climate strike. Um, but and, and obviously a company like Amazon that is so global in its reach can have influence on the practices also of its suppliers. So if Amazon says we will not accept a certain type of transportation service or a certain type of product if it doesn't meet these standards, that could have more of an impact than any national policy. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's much harder to hold the private sector accountable than it is national governments. Uh, and the level of transparency that's often associated with these 
targets is 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 often wanting there aren't the kind of independent audits that you might uh, that you might want and as was referred to before uh, the private sector doesn't always have a, a perfect record when it comes to keeping its environmental targets uh, whether it be Volkswagen <coughs> and they're often some of the biggest culprits in our environmental disasters uh, so we we need to be both welcoming and skeptical uh, and not just rely uh, on the private sector uh, for the change that we really need <laughs> And Frisch, uh, do you get the sense, though, that in a way it's easier to enact change because these these multinationals are huge and they and they cross borders much more easily than than the world leaders that are gathered in New York. They they are actors of the change, but they cannot without the policy, without uh, the world leaders, <coughs> without the social movement. So it's it's a, it's a combination. But I think I think what the fundamental issue is is. Is not is one, on the one hand. There's two issues. One is we need to accelerate the policy impulse to massively accelerate investments of what you're saying that to get out of fossil fuel, etc. But we need at the same time also realize that even if we do that, even if we have an economy that and a technology that changes, even then we cannot continue to consider growth the way we have done before. So we need to, I think in the long run, think about a very differentiated so, so notion of growth. So, and Jakob, do you, see, do you see a candidate for president in France stepping up and saying, I promise you less growth? Well, I think you, well, you, you will see some. I think the Green candidate will most probably say that. Otherwise, if he doesn't, I would be very disappointed. Because the argument you would have to bring is to say, it is not about not investing in technology. It's not to say people sit around and do nothing. It's not people go back to the Stone Age. It is to say that you integrate indicators that indicate, that measure quality of life. And I think that is the fundamental transition that needs to happen at the same time. Otherwise, Otherwise, you cannot accommodate the change in lifestyles that you have to impose on society. And today, and that's where maybe we disagree, society, in my view, is not ready to have. Imagine you had a benevolent dictator who would say today, OK, I impose the client program as radical as it should be. There would be vast opposition to it, regardless of what people say, because it's not enough. It's not just about recycling your yogurt, your yogurt lid, or to you know eat less meat, and that you're off the right. It has fundamental impact. You will be traveling less. You will be going more near. You will have more public transportation. You will use your bike. You will walk. All things which, for public health, are good things. In the end. But for, for today, if you told people that's what you have to do, I don't think people are ready. And so we need to step up that social or societal part also. I just want to precise, it depends who, who, uh, which people you're talking about. Because, for instance, the people in the Pacific have been, uh, so who've done the least in terms of growth and CO2 emissions, they're already ready, they're already having the solutions in their lifestyle and they're ready for that. So, uh, yeah, let's not forget that there are also big imbalance uh, between Absolutely. the people who have... Um, who are emitting the most and uh, a lot of others. And I think with that, it means, for example, countries like in Africa would still need growth and we should allow them to grow because it can't be the one size fits all. Right. It's Europe and advanced nation, we need to have more qualitative growth and a qualitative definition of how much because we need to cap our resource use. Whereas maybe in some other countries, there's still some leeway and maybe countries such as the Philippines, they get a little bit of more growth because they're sort of somewhere in the middle. Right. And I think a global view is absolutely crucial for that. It is crucial indeed. Jacob Hesser, I want to thank you. I want to thank Clémence Dubois. I also want to thank Anne French and uh, David Cantor for being with us from New York City. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. So as you can imagine, uh, Greta Thunberg remains as much uh, the darling of the media 
as ever, certainly with uh, all of the exposure she's been getting uh, in this trip to the US. Just to, some of the quotes that have been filtering out on social media because we're getting the sound bites, we're also getting the quotes via uh, social networks as well. This is wired. People are suffering, people are dying, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are at the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales. I suppose what you don't have there with the words is that the emotion mm. and the passion that accompany them, but the words in themselves are very strong. That's in wired.com. News 24 India. The eyes of all future generations are on you. And I think it's safe to say that the eyes of the world are on her as she is uh, uttering those words. So it's, it's getting a massive amount of exposure. Uh, this is uh, another um, extract from uh, ABC, uh, uh, the US in this case. Uh, this is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you come to us young people for hope. How dare you? And I think the audacity of that particular extract uh, got a huge amount of, 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 of reactions. Just to take a look at two reactions on the, underneath that particular extract. Unhinged nonsense, except for the bit where, yes, she should be in school. And I, I think that sums up um, a, a, a big uh, portion of those who don't take Greta Thunberg seriously. This would sum up, I would say, another reaction immediately underneath. Good for her. She is the future. The world leaders are failing our children. I think those two responses pretty, are, are a pretty good resume of, mm. of how people are responding to Greta Thunberg on, on either ends of uh, the spectrum, I, I guess you could say. This is an image that has been massively shared in the last 24 to 48 hours, going back 13 months ago uh, to when she started that protest all on her lonesome uh, on front of the parliament in Stockholm uh, with people um, commenting on that, how some finding the image, uh, such as Louise MacDonald, incredibly moving, 15 years of age alone in front of the Swedish parliament. And that is being uh, juxtaposed with several images of the amount of uh, a following that she's since uh, generated. What a difference one year makes and a lot of courage and perseverance. There's also other images that are being juxtaposed, Francois. This is uh, one tweet that Gosh. got, um, you can see there, thousands and thousands and thousands of retweets and shares. Uh, some people really, really dislike Greta Thunberg and, and, and this particular comment uh, by uh, Dinesh D'Souza, who was a, an advisor to uh, Ronald Reagan back in the day, uh, supporter of the Republican Party, a uh, very polarising figure in and of himself, Holy came shit. out with this comment. Notably, Nordic white girls with braids, red cheeks were used in Nazi propaganda. That shocked a lot of people, I think it's fair to say, because uh, <laughs> first of all, he was just zeroing in on the fact that she has braided hair and that she's kind of Nordic looking, like 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 uh, lots racist. of different populations. Yeah. It's uh, indeed, it's kind of a, it's a racist comment, in fact, you could argue. Uh, so that's a, uh, to show uh, the level of vitriol uh, and ridiculing that there is of her. Others saying, you know what, she should she she should be she should be considered for the Nobel Peace Prize. So that's on the other end of the spectrum, saying that if she were to get it, uh, she would be the youngest since Malala. Now, other comments uh, reacting uh, to, to this. Uh, Dominique Schnapper, who is a sociologist and uh, the daughter, in fact, of Raymond Aron, uh, a very famous French philosopher, she was reacting to uh, the Greta Thunberg phenomenon on France Culture Radio. What she said is that she gives her a feeling of malaise, uh, that there's a certain... wondering if she's not even being used in some respects, and that the fact that she is so young uh, is something that does strike her, uh, 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 that you know, she can't know more than the, the, the actual experts. Uh, 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 so, you know, what I'm saying is those who make those remarks, it's not just that people who are utterly that. against everything she represents. Some people who actually find the content interesting <laughs> find uh, the form somewhat uh, unsettling. Cl Clémence Dubois, reaction? I think... No, I don't want to comment uh, the idiots from the world. <laughs> okay. Well, it, 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 a lot of people uh, don't agree with that. Uh, this is uh, one response I got uh, on social media, uh, on Twitter. She is, a, if, if, regarding that particular extract on France Culture, she's a force in life politics and has succeeded in mass mobilization of climate change and awareness. It really doesn't matter how old she is, how much she knows, or what she looks like. Another saying, I read something that if someone has nothing left to attack you on, they start going for your looks, wise words. Uh, Greta's annoying all the right uh, people. You can, you will, and you must, it was another comment here, not directly to me, but on social media. Don't let anyone tell you you're too young to sway young people's hearts and minds. And that reminded me of this, uh, I'll finish with this, this, uh, this cartoon, um, if I can pull it up properly. It was uh, on, uh, this is going back uh, to last year on the climate summit. Il faut, it is necessary before, it would be necessary during, and it would have been necessary after. In other words, climate summit, the necessity of acting now so that you don't um, 
act when it's too late. And I think that's, I guess, the message that mm. she's trying to hammer home with all of that yeah. emotion. It's like, and it could be too late if we don't saying, listen We've to not science. listened to the science. That's what she it's, says, listen not to, not science. to science. She's not and saying we have to act now, the for lunatic sure. things. All right. James Creedon, many thanks. thanks I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 Today.